in public affairs. She has worked with the WFA since 2016 in a variety of projects, uh, including Signature in Initiatives, Girls of Promise, and Women of Empowerment. Please welcome our guests. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for having us here to speak today. Alrighty, so today we are going to be talking about um, encouraging diversity in your STEM classroom. Again, I'm Maddie Spickard. This is Ryder Buttrey, and we're from the Women's Foundation of Arkansas. So the Women's Foundation of Arkansas is a 501c3 nonprofit that is focused on women and girls in Arkansas. Our signature initiative, Girls of Promise, um, focuses on getting girls engaged in STEAM subjects and maintaining their interests so that they can go on to pursue careers in STEAM. We host a variety of programs for girls, including a two-day conference for eighth grade girls, two half-day coding summits, one in July, one in December, for sixth through twelfth grade girls, and we grant money to STEM education partners within the state. So why is diversity an important issue in my STEM classroom? For the purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus mostly on gender diversity, but we're also going to touch on both racial and socioeconomic diversity as well. So girls and confidence, let's talk about that for a second. We know from studies and research that confidence declines as girls get older, as does their belief in their ability in math or science. The sharpest change is between fifth and ninth grade. And then the rates level off a little bit, but they don't recover by the time they graduate high school. We also know that from fifth to ninth grade, there is a 26% drop in girls' confidence levels and a 15% decrease in the girls who believe they are good at science and math. The interest is there, but the confidence is not. The girls' interest in pursuing a career in math or science increases by 16% from fifth to ninth grade and continues to increase throughout their high school um, education. So we also know that overall, 73% of girls believe they are good at math and science, but this changes depending on various factors such as race and socioeconomic status. For example, Less than half of Hispanic girls surveyed believe that they are good in STEM subjects. Girls really need to see it to believe it. They need to see someone representing STEM careers that look like them, someone that they can look at and identify with and say, oh, she did it, I can do it too. That's why it's so important to have racial, gender, and socioeconomic diversity in your STEM programming, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So we also know that half of high school girls are considering a career in math or science, yet only 6.7% go on to actually earn a degree in a STEM field. So why is that gap so large? Why is there still this huge disparity between girls who are interested and inspired by STEM in their middle school and high school education, but not actually earning those careers, earning those degrees and going on into those careers. The missing link here is increasing girls' confidence while increasing access and exposure to STEM courses, activities, and opportunities. So we also know the STEM workforce is growing at a substantial rate. Um, but we know the greatest disparities of women in uh, this workforce occur in engineering and computer science fields. Black women, Latinas, and other women racially underrepresented in STEM compromise fewer than one in 20 employed scientists and engineers. And we know that this, this um, industry is booming and there's gonna be over a million new jobs added in the STEM workforce between now and 2022. So we do not want girls and minorities to be left behind and miss out on these opportunities. This is a great opportunity for jobs related to STEM, so we must recruit and retain a diverse group in the STEM pipeline. So I'm gonna talk now that we've gotten the research and, and kind of um, why, why are we having these issues. I'm gonna get to some of the best practices that you can really implement in your classroom um, to help encourage and maintain a diverse STEM classroom. 
Um, and so there's three things that research we're familiar with and, and our experiences in programming, programming have shown us really help encourage and maintain, maintain diversity in the STEM classroom and, and programming in general. And those three things are recruitment, representation, and retention. And all three of these things are really important on their own, but they're really linked. And, and when we accomplish one, we're helping to accomplish the rest. So it's really important we take a multi-pronged approach to diversity in our STEM classrooms. Um, before I get into kind of how to go about these, I'm going to just go over equity because I think it, sometimes we get it confused with equality. And I have the definition up there. But I think this um, graphic is the best way to explain it. And you can see equality. Uh, they each have an equal stool of the same height. But equity accounts for the difference in their height so that they can each reach the apple. And um, in education, this is really important because it, it's basically just allocating resources based on different needs. And so another example I like is if you had two tests with the exact same content and you gave it to students, that would be, that would be equal. But to truly be equitable, you would need to account, take into account other things. So if one of the students is blind, to be equitable, you need one of those tests to be in Braille. And so thinking about that in STEM is race, gender, socioeconomic status all lend themselves to different needs, especially in STEM where these groups have been traditionally um, disencouraged and, and left out. Um, I'm going to let Maddie talk about this video um, before we show it real quick. So one of the things we've done at the Women's Foundation is we partnered with um, the Department of Education, AT&T, the Governor's Office, and Axiom. And we had girls create their own public service announcement encouraging their female and minority peers to take computer science classes. I, need to, I think I can give you permission real quick from my phone. <laughs> okay, it should let you. We can move on and if it starts working. Um, but this video is basically just a peer-to-peer -peer encouragement um, to encourage girls and, and take off all the labels they've traditionally been given when it came to STEM. It's hard to be a girl. People never think you can do as much as men. And the moment they lay eyes on you, they see dumb, dependent, easily hurt, passive. But STEM made me see different. People think I can be limited until I create something limitless, until I prove them wrong. You can waste your time living in the lines or you can cross them. We choose to cross them. We make our own ways. We choose to set our own path. Because of computer science, this is what I strive, not hide. So we wanted to show that because A, that was, that was kind of a recruitment tool and that's the first thing I'm going to talk about, but also it gets to another idea of representation. Um, and peer-to-peer -peer encouragement. And so those are some things I'm going to hit on when talking about these three things. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is recruitment. Um, and so I think as a school, it's really important to keep the mindset that you're part of the pipeline that can feed women and minorities into these STEM jobs. And so the earlier we recruit them and we get them in that pipeline young, um, the better it is. So some best practices um, in the classroom um, that can really, we can engage girls. We have to be strategic and engage girls because girls, minorities, they don't see themselves traditionally in STEM, so a lot of times they're not going to sign up for the class on their own. 
And so we really want to engage them and meet them where they're at. And a good way we found to do that is project-based learning. So using projects um, to address real-world problems, curing cancer, environmental issues, um, cyber, security, and crime. And there was actually a, a study from the National Academy of Engineering where they asked people if they wanted to be engineers. And girls were twice as likely as boys to say no. But when asked if they wanted to design a safe water system, save the rainforest, or use DNA to solve crimes, they said yes. So we found this is a really um, effective way to engage girls in STEM subjects. And that really focuses on the in interdisciplinary and problem-focused nature of STEM. And something we're focusing on in the foundation uh, to engage more girls is incorporating the arts. So you hear STEAM a lot now. And we've partnered with some organizations like Arkansas Cinema Society and others to incorporate the arts into our STEM programming. And then lastly, um, it's the format. So girls' studies show do not perform as well with multiple choices they do with open-ended questions. And it actually, um, one study showed a 25% difference in standardized test scores between males and females when it came to multiple choice versus open-ended uh, questions. So framing questions in a way that girls that set girls up for success is going to encourage them more and, and get, them, um, get them excited about STEM. And then second um, is representation. And so recruitment is really necessary because we have a lack of representation. So once we recruit these girls, we want them to feel like they belong. We want them to see themselves represented in these subjects and these roles. And so once we strate strategically recruit, a diverse STEM classroom, um, we want to emphasize representation so they feel comfortable and competent as they learn. And I think that um, this is really important because girls and minorities are at a risk of stereotype threat. And I have the, the formal definition up there, but I think in education what this really means is the mere perception that the group one belongs to um, is not good at something can lead to lower academic performance that's not based on actual ability. So. Um, in order to minimize this risk, emphasizing representation is very effective. And some ways to do that in the classroom is first emphasizing practice over innate ability um, improves performance. If we tell girls and minorities, practice can make you better. Um, boys aren't just born with this gift. That even if you're good, you can get better through practice. That's going to be really encouraging to them and get them excited to keep um, engaging in STEM. And then. Second, um, representing minorities and women in STEM throughout your classroom, throughout your classroom materials. Um, assigning group or individual work that, that contextualizes and summarizes uh, minority and women's achievements in STEM. So they can see, you know, people have been successful, people are successful that look like me, I can do this too. And then last, a lot of times um, female teachers themselves feel a discomfort with science or math for the same reasons that their students do. Um, but encouraging a growth mindset for both you and your students. So mistakes are okay, um, things like that, and eliminating phrases in front of the students like, I'm bad at, or this is hard, um, really presents you as a role model for those girls in your classroom. And then lastly is retention. Um, so recruitment and representation are really useless to build this STEM workforce pipeline if women and minorities are not retained. And so a large part of retention is uh, representation, which is what we were just talking about. So um, if, we, if we achieve at representation and we create this sense of belonging, um, not only can we recruit, but that's really key for, for retaining. And so exposure, once again, having those um, female and minorities in your classroom materials, but also bringing in speakers, um, bringing in instructors, if you're not one yourself, maybe for a guest lecture, and also peer mentoring. So if you have female and minority students um, in higher level STEM courses that can serve as peer mentors to those just entering STEM, that'll be really encouraging them to see, hey, this girl who's just like me, a few years older, is succeeding in this high level class. I should go on and do that as well. Um, and then also team composition. So when you're, when you're assigning groups and teams in class, thinking about this, especially for women, is so important because uh, it is found to, to decrease performance if a, a girl is the only one in her group or a very small minority. So really having diverse teams and groups. And then this last thing is something we focus on really closely at the foundation, um, and that's transitional life points. Research shows that girls are really at risk of, of losing their interest 
in STEM in these transitional points. So from elementary to middle, from middle to high school, from high school to college, and then from college to the workforce. And um, they're losing that sense of belonging. They're, they're moving to a new place. They are losing their peer groups. And so it's really important that we intervene at these points. And at the foundation, we do this with our conference for eighth grade girls, trying to get them um, that representation to be seen. They meet a lot of female role models right before they go into high school. And then they also meet other peers that are interested in what they're interested in. So I would really encourage you, if, if you're reaching kids that are just coming out of elementary, middle, or high school, to, to pay extra attention to how you can support those students through peer groups and um, even out of school activities, um, which is really important. And I don't know if this video is going to work. We can try it. Might have to give permission again. And this one's a little longer, but I thought it was a good way to um, sum up what we've been talking about. And um, a good example of some representation recruitment um, techniques that higher ed is, is using. So this is from the USC's College of Engineering um, to recruit young girls into STEM. And I think it should work now. Um, um, if I were a superhero, if I were a superhero and I had superpowers, I would use my superpowers, I would use my powers to save. There are many ways to save the world, with issues ranging from world hunger, curing cancer, crime, clean water, climate change, to energy. You might think you have to be a superhero just to make an impact, right? Well, what if I told you that you could also be an engineer? Don't believe me? Well, if you are a superhero, who or what would you use your powers to save? To um, save people. Other kinds of superheroes? The people who have cancer. To stop pollution. Like war? If I was a superhero, I would save the world from an asteroid. My family from kidnapping or any kind of crime. I would use my powers to save Earth. Do you think you can be a superhero? Mm, no. Mm, no. Can you go to school to be a superhero? Well, actually, I don't know. Yeah, kind of. Do you even think superheroes are real? Mm, yes. Oh, you do? Yeah, I pretty much don't think of superheroes as in powers, but more of what they think, like what's in their mind. Would you believe me if I told you that I've met some superheroes? No. No. <laughs> it's true. Superheroes are real. For example, what makes a superhero a superhero? Um, a superhero is kind, brave, and kind of very different from a, no a normal person because superheroes have different kinds of powers. And what do superheroes do with their special powers? They, they go save people from, from, from danger. What if I told you engineers are superheroes? I kind of believe you. So, so. It's true. Engineers have special powers, and they use them to save people and make their lives better every day. Maybe. Oh, you still don't believe me. Let me introduce you to some of our faculty at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. Superheroes help people when they're hurt or injured, right? Mm -hmm. Maya Matarik is an engineer developing robots that help people recover from injuries and strokes. Have you ever been sick for a day or two? Yes. Yeah. I like just want to go outside, but it's pretty hard when you're sick. What if you were sick for even longer and you had to go to the doctor every week to take special medicine? Ellis Mang is an engineer using biomedicine to deliver drugs wirelessly to patients so that they can stay at home. Did you know scientists predict a global water shortage in the next 20 years? Yeah, I learned that a few when I was in fourth grade. 
A superhero would put a stop to that, right? Mm -hmm. Amy Childress is an environmental engineer finding ways to turn ocean water into clean drinking water right now. Superheroes stop bad guys, right? Did you know that cancer kills almost 1,600 people a day in the U.S.? Wouldn't you say that makes cancer a supervillain? I'd call it like a super supervillain. Stacy Finley is a biomedical engineer working tirelessly to stop cancer using computer models. You could say she's using computers to cure cancer. Do you think you have to be able to fly to be a superhero? Yeah, I don't know if that's kind of superpower. Andrea Hodge is a mechanical engineer developing materials that might make flying safer for everyone. I think that's even better. Superheroes protect people, don't they? Yeah. Terry Benzel is an engineer using computer science to protect people all over the world from cyber attacks. Where do you think all these engineers got their superpowers from? From school, lots of learning, because without school you wouldn't know anything. From learning. I'm pretty sure they studied. As they went to school, they probably learned more and more. At school. Going to school. Schools. From school. I think the engineers got their superpower from school because um, you have to learn to be able to do engineering and things like that. That's right. Studying subjects like science, math, and computer programming can prepare you for a career in engineering. So it turns out, you really can go to school to be a superhero. Who would you use your powers to save if you were an engineer? Hurricane Sandy, but that was, I think that kind of was a long time ago, but I would have liked to help out with that. I would help the people in the Philippines who suffered from the typhoon and getting water and food. If I were a superhero, I would save people from floods, earthquakes, and other natural disasters. I would maybe try to like save people with cancer, like have a cure for cancer because Lots of people are dying from cancer. I would save animals all over the world being neglected by their owners. I would use my superpowers to save the ones, the, those kids who really need it and the people who really need it, like the poor. Superheroes make changes in the world. You don't have to have a cape or clothes on to be one. You just have to, like, if you see someone in danger and you help them. I think engineers can be superheroes in a way like we can make things to help people out. Yeah, I pretty much believe it. With their inventions and the things they make, it's pretty much their superpower right there. So I wanted to show that just because I thought it kind of summed up um, the ways girls like to be engaged in STEM and, and a good kind of tool for recruitment and representation. They were representing the women in their own college that were already working on these issues and, and recruiting other young girls through it. So um, another thing I wanted to mention is Obviously, peer-to-peer um, -peer and exposure to women in the field is really important, and I know you only have so many hours in the school day, so out-of-school exposure is something I know a lot of teachers um, try, to, try to give their students, and so I wanted to let everyone know about the programs we have um, that are upcoming, and... Um, our first one will be our December Coding Summit during Computer Science Education Week on December 13th. Um, it's a half-day coding camp for 6th through 12th grade girls, and we normally do that on a college campus so they can get a feel for that. And then um, our big two-day STEM conference for 8th grade girls will be April 2nd to 3rd, um, 2020, and that's a two-day conference uh, mostly held at the 4-H Center in, in Little Rock. And all these programs are free, um, completely free for girls. And we love to get good representation from across the state. So um, you can find out more info on our website and we're always posting dates and stuff on our Facebook. So um, if there's any questions, I, we would love to take them now or um, those are contact info too if, if you want any more information about our programs. Thank you all.